I'll never forget it. She said, you have got to learn how to forgive or you will die. And that mandate just kind of like hit me really hard. And I was like, okay, now I know what I have to do. (laughs) Now I have the appointment on, on how to get better. But I literally did not really know. So did you go through your own uh, forgiveness journey in your own life? Did this this be something that you embodied yourself? I really did. I I, I had a a challenging childhood and and it culminated in my mid to early to mid twenties, really being in a a pretty intense addiction and uh, was, was really, really on a, steep slope to killing myself and had a wonderful intervention and uh, ended up going to a a treatment center up in Canada, private treatment center, very spiritually based, which is really, I think, a a large part of where my spiritual awakening began to occur. It was just phenomenal uh, how they thought and taught and, and what occurred. But the counselor there said to me, she said, I'll never forget it. She said, you have got to learn how to forgive or you will die. And that mandate just kind of like hit me really hard. And I was like, okay, now I know what I have to do. (laughs) Now I have the appointment on, on how to get better. But I literally did not really know. She used the perfect words when she said, you know, you need to learn how to forgive. She didn't say you have to forgive in order to stay alive. She said, I need to learn. And I thought, wow, that's really, um, it began the whole process of me practicing and studying and, and, and reading about it and working with people and realizing that I didn't know what it was. And nor did a lot of people, not, not to throw anyone under the bus or make anyone wrong, but even people that were teaching it didn't really understand the mystical power of it and how transformational it can be. That just kind of came to me along my journey. I really think because I said inside of myself, okay, I'm going to learn how to forgive. Like that sort of intention was set in me and it sent me down a path of many years of practice and refinement and uh, a number of great miracles to, to testify to its power. Yeah. Could you break down maybe that a little bit for the audience, just what um, that looked like personally for you? Yeah, uh, the most important one was I was sexually abused at at six years old. And um, it was haunting me, it haunted my childhood. And it was really what I think I was running from and um, destroying myself around uh, from, you know, from the addiction. Uh, And So as I started to address that issue in some traditional therapy and some talk therapy and some non-traditional therapy, just getting as much support as I possibly could, um, I was practicing, like I was just doing, um, you know, how do I forgive this? How do I forgive this? Will forgiveness make this go away? Like I was asking those kind of questions, you know, because I would go to therapy and therapy didn't really help me understand forgiveness. You know, they talked Mm -hmm. about it and there were some, some good things that came out of it, but I really felt like I was on my own in, in this kind of research. And I was doing a spiritual counseling session. This was later, like I was probably about 30 and I was working as a choreographer and director and I was living in Los Angeles and I was being flown to Chicago uh, for a job, a big, a big job, a table read to see if, you know, if, if we were a match and stuff. And before I went, the day before, I was getting a spiritual counseling session. And she said, when we were talking about this issue of being sexually abused and how it was kind of continuing to to cause pain in in myself and within me. And she said, "Um, would you consider, could I have what's something like, will you let me do a prayer of forgiveness for you around this? And she said the magic word. It was like, bing, 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 bing. (laughs) I was like, Yes, <laughs> yes, I would love that. 
And uh, so she did this beautiful, powerful prayer. None of it was like, may Mark forgive this, you know, will Mark, you know, do this. She was like, you know, I ask that forgiveness be done within Mark's mind and heart. I ask that forgiveness set him free. Like she was, she was calling upon forgiveness to do its work. And I was noticing that. So anyway, I go to this weekend and we're doing the table read of the show and it was about sexual abuse. And I didn't pre-read the, the, the play. So I was like reading it while we're going along and I'm getting triggered inside me very deeply. I'm like, oh man, this stinks. But I got through the weekend and I got back on the plane and I, I remember this man, I sat in the, in the window by the, the seat by the window, put my sunglasses on, turned away. The tears were coming down my face. I closed my eyes. And I was like, I asked that forgiveness set me free. God, how can I, how can this be forgiven? And in that moment, I truly had a very mystical experience. And I was taken out of the story that kept repeating and repeating and haunting me. And I heard what I would say, God, God's voice say to me, see this how I see this. And suddenly all I saw was light dancing with light. That's all that was happening. And I was told that's all that's happening in back of all appearances, all appearances of suffering and um, appearances of um, anger and upset and, um, you know, and all, all the stuff that people have to work forgiveness around and back of it all in the back of all of life, there's only God. And, and, it, and literally I was shown light, dancing with light, dancing with light. It was so beautiful. And then that story of the abuse, it was like put into a, a kind of a crystal ball and like thrown out into the universe. And I was told this will never haunt you. It will never harm you again. It's over. The only reason you'll reference it is for teaching purposes. To this day, I've never been haunted by it. I don't think about it. Literally only for interviews or teaching when I'm doing workshops, does the story even come to mind to be spoken about? I truly had a spiritual, mystical healing done unto me where I was freed from the what I believed happened to the impact on my emotions, my physical sense, my thought system, it all kind of disappeared in a moment. And even to the point of, did that even happen? Like, I, I have memories of it, I have images of it, but did it happen? Because I can't find it. It's like, it's over. It's done. It is forgiven. That's a very dramatic story. But I share that story because that was really my first profound experience around what forgiveness can do. Because forgiveness isn't something that just gives you the ability to endure what happened or walk with a limp through life because of what happened. Like forgiveness truly is a psychic, emotional, mental, spiritual healing experience when people have it done unto them to the, to the end of the story um, where it literally has no, it has no impact. You, you are no longer the victim of the story. That truly is what occurs when we let it happen. Yeah, beautifully articulated. And you know, as you were saying that, I was just thinking about, you know, so many people tend to derive a sense of identity from holding on to the event that caused them harm in their life. And I think, you know, talking about sexual abuse is, is a great one to touch on because a lot of people would say, ah, unforgivable I can't let that go that's too bad you know that person doesn't deserve that I want to ask you about that that deserving thing for the perpetrator because I think this is where a lot of people get stuck they feel that if I give that person forgiveness I make that okay when clearly you know we look at sexual abuse and it, we know it's not okay what would you say to those people that would hold resistance in looking at the perpetrator and saying, well, they don't deserve that? Yeah, well, I, I, between me and you and in this moment, that's absolutely not true because everyone 
deserves complete forgiveness until everyone is restored to their natural being of love. But let's put that on the shelf for a moment because I understand where that question is coming from. Um, so the truth of the matter is, and this is really what is true. I had never seen this man for years upon years upon years. I didn't know if he was dead or alive. I had no reference whatsoever. So it wasn't even about him. It was about the suffering that I was experiencing yeah. that I wanted relief from. And that really is true on every level. The only problem that we're ever having is the story that we're repeating and holding either about ourselves or the other person. But if you pause for a moment and think, okay, so I'm holding the story about the other person, but where is that story living inside of me? What are the harmful thoughts? Where are the harmful thoughts having their effect inside of me? They're not even touching the other person. So there's this lie that says, if I forgive, then they get off the hook. Yes. And that's where matter- so many people, don't they? They get stuck there because yeah. it gives them a sense of, I think, power over the situation. Obviously, yeah. during the event, they felt a sense of complete powerlessness like you would as a child and it gives them power to at least say this is wrong i don't advocate this so i'm holding on to this to give me a perceived sense of power but i think in in the way that you pick it up it 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 ruminates within the victim Actually, victim is not a great word. Survivor, I like using that word better. The person that has survived the event, uh, we ruminate that inside of us. And eventually, it can cause sickness, depression, you know, some horrific things, can't it? Yeah, yeah. And you're right. You're right. But the power that we could gain is actually false power. It's very temporary because Mm -hmm. the power, the source from which it's coming is fear or anger um, or separateness. It's not the true power of your spirit. So it actually, any kind of false power that in the world is, you know, generates a lot of false power right now out of anger and division and all those things, that power is not the true sustaining power that will free you. It's the power that makes you feel alive in the moment, but it also keeps you trapped. And that's, that's what is the problem with that. And what are we trapped in? What we're trapped in is that what you said, like, I, I, it's a sense like I've been victimized or I've been harmed. And so this has given me some kind of a stand, something to stand on. Um, You know, it's like, I'm right. This happened. And I'm, you know, like there's this something that, that, that makes sense, but it's a lower vibration choice. And it it can be a beginning. I don't want to make it wrong, but it's not, you can't stay there. You know, maybe the first step in forgiveness is this happened. This is horrible. There, there are X, Y, and Z, you know, to sort of gate, like you can get some of your sense of self back through that, but it's just one step on the path. And a lot of people stay there, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I know it can be a I know it can be a process. I I had this personally in my life. I had to forgive also some family members that had wronged me early on in my life. And I remember going through different seasons with it. I, I forgave. And then I, I, I took on the trauma again. And it wasn't until probably about two years ago that I realized that I wasn't going to grow spiritually unless I got that key area resolved in my life and I really made a decision that I was just going to let that go and I think it can be a bit of a process I know you had a almost a profound spiritual experience but I think for some it maybe is a process of forgiveness but what I learned was it's it starts with a decision a decision is that I I am willing to forgive so it could be an affirmation and a willingness to let that go and then trusting life to provide a road in order for you to liberate yourself from it. Uh, So I think it can work very differently, can't it, for different people, their own personal journey with forgiveness can, can vary, can't it? 
It can, but what I've discovered and how I teach it, which I believe is the fast track, which is really what we want, um, first of all, is to remove the sense that I have to forgive. I, and this is where a lot of people get stuck. The part that, of you that believes it was victimized or harmed or is upset and feels like life is unfair, that's the part that thinks it now has to forgive. And that's not possible. That's like someone walking down the road, falling down a 30 foot hole and going, now I've got to get myself out of here. You can't jump 30 feet and you don't even feel bad about that. You just realize I can't get out of here. And so what do you do? You shout up and you ask for help. And people passing by notice you're there and they send down a ladder or a rope to help you get up out of that hole. That's a great analogy for forgiveness because forgiveness, unforgiveness, if you will, is being stuck down a 30 foot hole where you don't have access to your light. You don't have access to the sunlight, but for some reason, we think we're supposed to get ourselves out of that hole. And what I discovered is it's not even my job to go to the Course of Miracles for a moment. The Course of Miracles is very clear. It says the Holy Spirit's job is to do the forgiveness. The Holy Spirit, think of it as like a light of love, a thought in your mind that is like the lighthouse, the beacon. That's like, this is how you return to love. I'm going to show you how. It's like planted inside of you the way to return to love. That brilliant mechanism, that spiritual part of you is what does the forgiveness. It has the higher view. It knows exactly how to unravel the story. It knows how to set you and all of it free. I don't have that ability. I'm in the 30 foot hole thinking that I've been screwed and that life isn't fair. And now I got on top of it. I got to let that person off. It's not a winning equation. The winning equation is I can't. Holy Spirit can and what do we do? Just like the person stuck in the hole, we ask. And this is what I believe is the most powerful way to forgive. I ask that forgiveness set me free. That's a simple request that resounds throughout the universe. You know, the Bible says, ask, and it is given. Seek and you shall find, knock, and the door will be open. Thousands of years ago, here is mystical teaching that's saying, Asking is activation. Now you said it in a nice way too, because you said the intention. You yeah, know, you have willingness, to have absolutely, and willingness. openness, and then yeah. allowing the process to, um, you know, unfold, or allowing, as you put it, allowing help uh, to come into the situation. Right. As you were just saying that, I was thinking back to the Course of Miracles, and I'm not sure if everyone familiar with the course but I remember when I was looking at it and something that sort of profoundly it articulated really beautifully was this uh, was the fact rather that you know only love is real and fear is an illusion can you go a little bit into that and kind of preface that for the audience of, of actually how the course explains that state yeah yeah, I'm happy to do that. Um, so the, the a quote that is, so we say, it says, love is real. Fear is, there's, it says there's two things. There's love and there's fear. Fear is not real. Therefore, there's only love. So that's a perfect equation. Love plus nothing equals love. <laughs> now, the work of the course is to help you see that that fear actually is nothing, meaning no thing of itself. The only reason it is known and felt in here is because of our belief and our support of it. The way I like to think about it, because it still can be confusing, love will never disappear. It is absolutely who you are, and it extends forevermore. No one can destroy it. Fear, on the other hand, as soon as you become free from it, it disappears. It's not permanent. It's not forever. It is a temporary experience, like walking down the street, one of the, you know, walk, going on a hike and you see a snake in the road and you're scared of this gigantic snake and you come up to this, you get close to it, and you realize it's a rope. It's not really a snake at all. You were afraid of nothing. Where did the fear of the snake go? The moment you knew that there was nothing to fear, it disappeared. So that's a very simple way to say it's not 
ultimately real because you've experienced, every one of us has experienced fear being very real and then at some point disappearing. <laughs> when, and when fear disappears and when you're just in your natural state of being and you're relaxed and you're peaceful and you're feeling good, you are in your natural state of love. That is your permanent constant. That's what's real. Anything that is temporary is not real. So I, I don't know if that helps, but that's like the best way I can de describe it. Like love is real capital R and fear is real small R. Totally. <laughs> that and I think it's own. a good, it's, it's definitely a good thing to touch on because aren't we so living in a, a world of society at the moment where fear is something that's almost a currency, isn't it? I mean, the media oh, like to, to use this as a, a, as a form of, you know, controlling or attracting uh, an audience and governments use it around the world. And it just seems all pervasive at the moment is this, this narrative of fear and how people are perhaps easily manipulated by it. Um, how would you talk to that? Maybe, uh, in current terms of what's unfolding in the world around us at the moment, going through a big event and fear is the currency, if you like, of this. Yeah, event. I like how you describe that. That's really good. Um, you know, and, and this is where people get stuck because on the spiritual path, a lot of people want to spiritually bypass, meaning they just jump to, oh, so this isn't real. It's not real, but I'm not saying you're not experiencing it. So yeah. if you go into wrong kind of denial and just like, oh, fear is in here, fear is in here, and it actually is, it's got a, even a stronger hold on you. So one way to do it is to, number one, recognize it's here. First of all, you know, like awareness, you know, wow, I'm feeling afraid. Fear is what's happening here. The awareness of that, number one, is in the first step is what then can allow you to do a couple of things. You can ask, I'm a big ask the Holy Spirit guy because I'm a Course in Miracles guy. So I would do something like, I ask the Holy Spirit to help me see this differently. I ask to be shown a higher experience of this so I can be restored to love. I'm a big asker. I'm activating the Holy Spirit all the time, but you could also just go, okay, I'm feeling fear right now. This isn't ultimately who I am or what is ultimately true. So that begins to loosen it up. And what you want to find is the space for another option. Sometimes we can do inquiry like Byron Katie work and really take the time to look at it and question the fear and begin to see the holes in it is what we're looking for. For that deeper breath, we go, oh, I'm beginning to see through this fear. That's when it will begin to dissolve. All of us have to learn our path, whatever that path is, we all have to begin finding our way to address fear, to face it, and then to watch it dissolve. You know, if I may real quickly, one of my favorite Bible stories is David and Goliath. I don't know if you know that one, but no, little Goliath, me. little Goliath who represents love goes out on the battlefield to represent, or I'm sorry, little David represents love big Goliath who represents fear. And he's the monster. He's the one that no one can take down and everyone's afraid of him. But David represent love, representing love goes right onto the field and he faces this big mountain of fear in his natural state of love with his natural gifts and talents. And the fear drops down with no effort whatsoever. We all have that ability within us. Every one of us does. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. I, lo I love that, that, that story and stories can be quite profound because they give us sort of uh, a basis to understand and stories have been used for centuries to uh, portray very profound um, things like that one. Um, I wanted to sort of ask you, you know, because I think th this is maybe pressing for the time, how, you know, if someone is maybe consumed by fear, and I think at the moment, 
you know, there's fear for different reasons. Some people fear the pandemic. Some people fear the oppression that comes with the pandemic and where we'll end up. How do you view what we're going through at the moment? And, and, and what advice would you give people that are maybe in fear for whatever reason? Um, how, how can they get out of it? Yeah, yeah. It is a it is everyone's individual journey, I think, because you're right, it's being so whooped up into storms upon storms upon storms that it is hard to find the way through. I think more important than ever before, and well, maybe always, but like I'm going to say now, uh, you know, listening to amazing YouTubes, a positivity, finding a spiritual community, that you can belong to. It's time for people to wake up to their spiritual power. And that can be one of the greatest outcomes of this because the way I look at it, and the reason it doesn't scare me as much, honestly, is because I always say this, I look at the world and I go, nothing new. There's nothing new happening in the world. Wars, starvation, abuse, pandemics. Like it just, if you go through time, all it recycles the itself, doesn't it? it? Just recycles itself. So people got to stop waiting for the world to change. Stop taking the effect of the world as the ultimate decider of your happiness, your joy, your peace. The only thing it will do is rob you of that. If you keep looking to the world, waiting for the world to change so that you can have a day of peace, then you might get your day of peace, but I promise you the next day, something's yeah. going to swoop in. So it's look, I look at the world and I'm no longer surprised. I'm no longer seduced. So then what do I do? That's when we turn to wake up within ourselves. Your spiritual power will keep you in a state of grace and peace beyond human understanding and beyond experience. Not only that, I believe that we are all being called, as many will answer, to wake up spiritually because what happens when you do get in touch with that power and you begin living from it, then you will be directed by it to go out into the world and be a beneficial presence. Many people go out into the world to fight fear from fear. That's never going to win. That's why it doesn't change. People, yeah, I, People's yeah. intention... The, the way things permanently change, like, like Gandhi, like Martin Luther King style, is that you've got to truly be moving from the love that you are, seeing everyone as powerful and free, believing that God is in every single person, believing that in back of this illusion of suffering, there is light dancing with light. And then you ask that light, use me use me. And then I promise you, you will be led and you will be fulfilled. And what is for you to do will find you. Yeah, beautifully articulated there. I wonder what that you, you mentioned God, and I, I think God can mean different things to different people. And yeah. I know for me, I grew up in the Christian church. So God meant, you know, uh, a guy with a beard on a cloud somewhere reaping out judgment and condemnation so many people have a background of god being this archetype what yeah. does god mean to you and what does he or it or they or however you want to label it i don't know if it's something we can actually label but what does god mean to you and who is god to you yeah i i believe that is been one of my greatest gifts of my path. And I think I'm not alone. I think many of us are exactly that. You're right, Paul. This is also the journey many are on. I, like most, had the external white male in the sky, keeping score, punishing, and had the power to decide if I was going to burn in hell forever or go into heaven and play the harp with angels and be bored forever. Like it was a no winning in my mind. I was like, I didn't think I wanted either of these images, but those images are driven by fear. That's what happened to me as a child. A male external punishing God is fear. That's all that it is. And it will keep people under control. And religions are using it still to this day, sadly. So that's what I was born with. I threw that God out. Baby with the bathwater, I threw it all out. But again, 
when I got into recovery and when my life depended on finding a new higher power is what the 12 step calls it. They use the word God, but they say a higher power of your understanding. So not only did I learn how to forgive along my journey, I recreated and re-experienced God. So God to me today is a principle of perfect love, life with, with, with no death. God is uh, grace and peace with no opposite, a goodness that knows no other, a light that knows no darkness. It is absolute being. So there's that one understanding and that gives people like, okay, I can kind of wrap myself around that. But then I had to really grow and move into the combination, which I think is the most powerful combo, which is also God is deeply personal. So it's principle and it's personal. And that's where it comes alive. And one without the other for me was lacking. But if I can really get behind the idea of God as perfect love, that knows no hate. And God is the perfect love in me. And God is the love that speaks to me. And God is something that I can really have a deep, fulfilling relationship with. It lives inside of me. It doesn't have a face. It doesn't have a, it doesn't have anything human. <laughs> but yet it's so personal that it makes me feel phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. That's, that was a long journey to get there. That was a long sure. And, you know, people that are students of the course, do, do you find that it diff, their perception of God differs on an individual level or collectively do people tend to have the same uh, understanding of what God is? It, it is a challenging thing. And I think people evolve. The course will help you evolve because there's so much love in the course, you know, that you read the lessons and there's just, God loves you. God loves you. Like it really keeps banging that drum mm -hmm. throughout the whole thing. So that definitely is healing. Um, but I, the, the challenging part of the course is that it uses traditional Christian terms like salvation, atonement, you know, it, it Holy and, Spirit, Holy yeah. Spirit. So th that's challenging for people. And it's written in the male, you know, content which came through in the 60s. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's God as he. And so that's very triggering for people, because I believe as a collective, we have evolved, many of us past that language, where we don't experience God as he you know, or, or at least we go, he, she, or, or mother, father, God, you know, we, we have that more inclusive energy, but the course is written more traditionally. Yeah, yeah. Do you, for those that aren't familiar with how the course came about, did you want to just give a quick intro to, to where it came from? Yeah, the Course of Miracles, A Course of Miracles, is a channeled work. It is actually channeled from Jesus. And it came through a woman named Helen Shipman. Uh, she worked at New York University, I believe. She was a therapist, a psychiatrist, and a researcher. And um, she was working with her business partner, and I can't remember his name, and I should. I, my apologies on that. Uh, but, but they were having a conflict. Their relationship was very challenging. And they had to work together, and it was just suffering, suffering. And she spoke the words, there's got to be a better way. And the moment those words were spoken, that somehow cracked open in her access to the flow of this entire book, which is the textbook, the lesson book, and then a teacher's manual, all in one big chunky uh, a piece of work. And it's absolutely, and it's all channeled. It's Jesus speaking through her. She dictated and she received it for, I think, seven years. Wow. She was dictating this do you know book. how that evolved i mean how did she know that you know it was jesus did it did it sort of come through an announcement had she channeled before uh, no. that event no. it was just a spontaneous thing that occurred yeah i mean as it was flowing through her it became clear quickly that it was jesus and she yeah. had a lot of resistance i mean she was not looking in her life to channel this book. There was nowhere in her, on her vision board or on her list of goals <laughs> to have a conversation with Jesus and channel this book. It was really a divine appointment that she didn't even know existed 
until that very moment. So I think it was very healing. It was very challenging. Um, as I've listened to her stories and studied it, you know, she could kind of turn it off and on at will, but then there would be times in the middle of the night where she would feel it poking at her. And so she'd have to get up and, and get some more flowing. And it was a wonderful business partner who this man who would help the dictations and help get it all printed. So they literally became, who were foe at in work, became friends in the purpose of Within, bringing this book. Yeah. yeah. And I know a lot of people have struggled with, you know, being students of the course, but they, they maybe buy it in a bookshop and pick it up and start reading it and then realize how convoluted the language is. Maybe it's a little bit intellectual uh, in its uh, delivery. What would you say to those people that maybe have an intrigue with the, the course, but have maybe uh, stumbled in, in, you know, applying themselves because of its convoluted nature, particularly yeah. in its language? Yeah, I would say I completely hear you. I bought the book in the early 1990s and I couldn't read it for 10 years. Wow. Um, but during that time, I was listening to Marianne Williamson lecture on the book. I was listening to this minister at Unity of Chicago, a church that I would go to. She was lecturing on the book. So I started by just, and my goodness, today on YouTube, you can hear a thousand people lecture on the book. And for me, that was a great way to just begin welcoming the principles and hearing people that were deeply in love with the book and were able to speak from it. That was very, very helpful to me. The book speaks at a few angles that it doesn't explain well. You just got to kind of find your way. Sometimes it's talking about the ego mind. Sometimes it's talking about your natural oneness with God. Sometimes it's talking about the Holy Spirit healing power. Sometimes it's talking about Jesus. Sometimes it's referring. So when you learn to discern, oh, this is the void. And this, now they're talking about this. Suddenly, like a work of art, a masterpiece, it starts to braid itself together and it's effortless. It is effortless for me to read it and drink it. And well, I shouldn't say totally. Sometimes I got to slow down on a sentence or two. But the way that I understand it today, just from continuing to, to immerse myself in it, it will unravel. It will show yeah. me. Has it, it has it sort of pushed you to read the Bible in, in as a sort of companion to this? Because I know you it talks about you know, channeling Jesus. Do you think that the Bible uh, is an accurate representation of who Jesus was? Uh, great question. Um, I think it more so than ever, because my understanding of who he was and what he did through the portal of A Course in Miracles has, has expanded me. For example, it, it, without un, without understanding the course that all sickness is an illusion that none of that is real then you're listening to, then you're imagining jesus walking around and he's just like a magician and he's got these special powers that no one else has because he can say blind person see dead person come alive you know crippled person walk it just seems like magic you know but when you realize the the mental state that jesus walked in which is oneness and truth. And he did not see sickness. He didn't see a sick man. He didn't see a blind man. He saw pure spirit and he knew that pure spirit always reveals itself when it's called forth. So because he, that was very profound to me. When, when I now see someone sick on the street, if I see that they're sick, I go, I ask for forgiveness, heal my mind because I'm seeing that person as sick. I'm not seeing them as whole. I'm not seeing them as one with God. I'm not seeing them as capable and powerful. I'm seeing them as sick. Where does that problem live? In me. I don't believe Jesus walked in that problem. I don't believe he saw sick people. He didn't see incapable people. He saw God. And when God sees God, something good's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And do you feel like, you know, 
that uh, Jesus had something more than we can obtain? Or do you think what he embodied and his essence is something that we all can uh, be? Yeah, I I won't go down this rabbit hole too quick, too much, because I don't, but I was in India for 30 days and one of my, one of my trips to India and Jesus started talking to me about three days in very, very clearly, like how we're talking. I'm like, it was very, very profound and mystical. And I spent the whole month like hanging out with, with Jesus. I was like my companion the whole time. So I had a very personal experience and love affair with this brother that is now like, that's how I see him. Just my, my soul brother. Like, mm-hmm. And what I guarantee you is that if there's ever a quote from the Bible that you want to hang on to and have written on your wall is this and greater things shall you do. That's what Jesus said. Yeah. Jesus said this and greater things shall you do. Maybe he had a glimpse of thousands of years later with the internet and flying and all the possibility. I don't know. But what he knew was that the infinite possibility of God in him was everywhere and in every one. And if people don't read the Bible from that vantage point, they will always come up short. And that's where the course is amazing because the course Jesus says in the course of miracles, look, don't give me awe. Don't put me up on a pedestal. I'm walking next to you. God deserves awe. But all of us, we're just together. And, and Jesus says in the course, I am with you until there is no, there is no time. I'm, I'm done. That's what it says in the Bible. So think of Jesus as this loving presence that is here until your suffering is over. It's just a phenomenal helper that knows how to become free from suffering because he did it. Yeah. And, you know, uh, as you're saying that, I'm just thinking about how, you know, Jesus is somewhat of an idol, particularly in mainstream religion. And Jesus is worshipped as God himself or the embodiment of God. Does your, uh, the way you see Jesus differ majorly from say a Christian that would worship Jesus on a Sunday and throughout their week? Um, I, I don't know. Cause I don't know their path. So, I mean, I could, don't know that I could compare another person's path, but, um, what, what I do know is that Jesus's healing ability and oneness, because you are one with this, this being there, you're not separate from, from this being. Um, Jesus is available to everyone at the level that they'll let Jesus be available. So if someone is new at spirituality, like, oh, Jesus is outside and Jesus is, is better than me. And they're sort of like doing that external, um, uh, you know, putting him on a pedestal. I imagine Jesus going, okay, well, I'll hang out here until you evolve to a different way of relating to me. I think love just meets us where we are. And Jesus is synonymous with love. So yes, wherever people think and believe and whatever is positive and good about Jesus, that will be their experience. And I imagine Jesus as an infant being goes, there's more, there's more there's more. Yeah, beautifully said. I wanted to ask you just more about your work and um, some of my audience will be familiar with you, some not. So do you want to talk about what you do uh, in your work? I know you travel around when when travel is available and and (laughs) you do stuff online. Tell us about your work. Yeah, well, the one thing that I would like to tell you about, because we are just currently launching Um, our next year program. It's called Living the Course. And the website is livingthecourse.com. And I have a business partner whose name is Aaron Abke. And we came together about a year and a half ago. And just on a show just like this, and we were hanging out and we had such a great connection that we're like, what can we do next? What can we do next? Well, we birthed a program where we help people live a course of miracles. So if you're interested and you really want to explore that, it's a great way because we do the lessons for you and with you. And uh, Aaron has a really beautiful, unique genius around bringing Eastern philosophy into it and taking and showing you how it, it says it in this Christian language, but look, Buddha said it this way and the law of one teaches it this way. And so we both dance together 
around the core teaching of the day and help people to really live it, embody it. And we have a blast. We have a blast doing it. That's a global community. And people from all around the world are a part of that. Uh, so definitely check that out, livingthecourse.com. I also do um, a lot of spiritual counseling, coaching, um, and channeling uh, to help people on their spiritual path. If they're looking for more of a one-on-one -on -one, um, kind of a support system, I, I really enjoy doing that. And my website is markanthonylord.me. So right. you can and find I'll leave, there. I'll leave links to all that on the screen so people can easily uh, wonderful. Thank you. see that as well. Thank That's you. a good segue there, channeling, because I think, you know, we talked about the course and the, the course being a channeled work. And I'm, I'm reading a book at the moment or rereading a book uh, that's a channeled work. And there's this through the uh, spiritual community, lots of channeled works uh, yes. that are incredibly profound. Talk to me a little bit about your channeling and how that came about. It, it started, um, it was like 1999. I was living in Los Angeles and I had this very profound kind of spiritual opening one day where I literally was like, you can channel, you can heal, you can help people, you can be a channel for that. And it freaked me out. And I didn't know what to do. I don't come from those kind of people. You know what I mean? Like I was raised in a, in a Catholic world. And like, it, I had no reference that even allowed me to accept that. So although I'll never forget it, I pushed it under the rug for probably another 15 to 18 years, 20 years of just not doing it. However, I was, when I speak and when I teach People would say to me all the time, oh my God, you're channeling. Wow, I see the moment you click and then something's flowing through you. And, and, and I never had to work hard at putting my talks together. They just, I'd do an outline and then something else would happen when it was time to do it. So I felt safe to be able to do that. But a, about a year or two ago within the last time, whatever, um, it started knocking on my heart again. And it was saying like, you must help people heal. You must help people. And it wasn't saying me. It was saying like, you must let this healing light channel through you. So I've been working with that. And I've been allowing it. And it really is quite, and I did say to it, I'm like, you better prove yourself quickly because <laughs> I was not going to mess around with this one. And I truly have been, uh, I, if I just completely get out of the way and someone comes and they have a, a situation or experience to share with me, um, very much like the work you do, by the way, I did a session with you, Paul, and it was absolutely phenomenal. And yeah, we had a great time, didn't oh we? Oh my it was God. Quite profound. It was crazy. And, but I do believe that it was profound because I have access to, I'm not afraid of that channeling anymore. So I was able, but it was nice because you helped me do it for myself. You know what I mean? Which was a different experience. And that was such I got to sing your praises for a moment because your genius facilitation of that flow of information. And, and I was noticing like you'd ask a question that went to the next question effortlessly and it just yeah. helped the next thing come well, through. It's always helpful having a guide, isn't it? And oh. I suppose when we, when we, when we see ourselves in this light is we're all, we're all just guides, aren't we? Helping guiding others to maybe for what we have achieved or where we've gone, Jesus was that. He was a guide to, well, he still is for, for people today. The course is a guide. My work is a guide for others uh, yes. to find what's always been inside of them. And, you know, I'm, I might mention this is that, you know, throughout the centuries, all of these spiritual teachers like Buddha and Jesus always had this universal message is that the power is within you and that the answers are within you, but it's wow. connecting and tapping into that. And I think a lot of our work is means to tap into what is within, but don't we live in a culture where we've been programmed, so to speak, that if you buy this or get this or obtain that, that's what you know it's pointing the arrow outside of oneself rather 
back to oneself, knowing that the answers have always been in us, haven't they? Absolutely. And you're right. And that's why I, I've come to appreciate that this thing called channeling isn't, isn't unique. We're all doing it at different times. The musician is channeling the music. The therapist is channeling a healing power through their words. The surgeon is channeling. Like we're all, you're right. We're all helping each other. We're all guiding and supporting and trading places, you know, when it's, when it's time to do that. And, you know, as your work helped me access the inner voice for myself, when I do my channeling, I have the ability to just listen to that voice, get out of the way, which you did brilliantly, and then focus on the other person's energy. And I just let what I hear, it literally happens. I hear it in my gut and I repeat the words. I just literally, I listen and whatever it wants me to say, I just say it. That's all that I do. So it's like, you got to kind of relax and get out of the way. So did, uh, I guess this is, you've almost answered my question, but I'll get you to sort of go into it <laughs> further. But everyone can do this, can't they? I mean, a lot of people get these perceptions of, you know, Abraham can, or Esther Hicks can channel Abraham or, you know, uh, Barbara Messiniak can channel the Palladians or Mark can, can channel. But when people are uh, talking about their own lives, do they have this ability uh, and does everyone have this ability? Everyone has the ability to channel life, mm. to become a vessel to experience the flow. And when anyone is in the flow, they feel like they're, they're just in the moment, you know, again, whether it's, you know, a mother who is meant to be a mother it, and it just, when the, she's with her children, she or he, whatever is with their children, and they're just loving them and guiding them and being with them. And, and it's timeless. And it's like, there's this through me experience, like something's flowing through. I'm not thinking, I'm not planning. I'm not figuring out the words are there when they need to be the music, the movement, whatever it is, we all channel flow. And maybe that's a better way to look at it. Channeling is literally hearing voices, hearing, feeling energy for the purpose of healing. That's one way to define it, but a more broader way to look at it would be to what is your flow? And the more you can find your flow, the more you will feel alive and happier. Yeah, re really well put. What does that mean? How does one get into the flow? And I know people that, you know, do work like I do and you, you're on video and you want to get into that flow, that flow state. How yeah. would you recommend people get into the flow state? Uh, I typically, I definitely always do some form of breathing, even if it's box breathing, four, four count in, hold for four count, four count out, hold out for four count, just kind of box breathe 10 times to just really get a nice um, flow of that. That's a great way. Uh, learning, you know, we cannot sidestep the importance of meditation. Yes. And yes. that's one of the things I'm no longer interested in hearing people. I can't meditate. Yes, you can. <laughs> just stop. Just stop it. We all have got to get to that, that relaxed, quiet place inside ourselves, which really means the mind and the emotions are calm. And that's what we need for access. You're not going to hear or be the flow for anything while you're in an emotional storm. I mean, Think about it. If you, if you, there's a nice flat body of water and you pour a cup of water into it, you see it and you see its effects. If the body of water is literally a gigantic storm, you pour a cup of water into it, then you don't know where it is. You don't see where it goes. It's immediately gone. That's a good analogy of why we have got to work at calming the mind and being in that quiet because you will have a, a quicker access to your gifts and talents. Yeah, I'm glad you spoke about meditation because it's something that I share a lot with my audience. It's just the importance of it. And not only in the importance of it, but the actual ritual or routine of it on a daily basis. You know, we wouldn't go a day without brushing our teeth. Uh, I mean, no, the consequences of that on other people wouldn't be too, <laughs> too nice. And 
that's probably a, a good illustration of of perhaps what can um, be the negative side, if you like, of of not doing something ritualistically or on a daily basis, a part of our routine, because there's yeah. consequences, isn't there, if we don't build these mechanisms into our daily life. Yeah. And, you know, I have a lot of compassion for all of us because that too was my journey. When I, I was being raised in a family that our religion and our spirituality was so disconnected. It was all just by rote. Our prayers were by rote. Nothing was really alive. So I didn't, I wasn't taught as a child, the true gifts of being quiet and meditating or prayer, you know, because all of the adults were completely asleep and just kind of walking through the motions. So, um, you know, many, many people are like that, where it's like, it seems too foreign and too far away, but that's just because you haven't given yourself the time to learn it. I really believe that at least for me, I can't do what I do or be who I am without at least an hour of some kind of not all meditation, but meditation and contemplation and reading the course and prayer. Like I have a prayer partner five out of seven days a week where I spend a half hour with someone that I know and love and they know and love me and we pray together. I mean, that's that's so different from how I was was raised. I mean, I wish I could teach everyone in the world how to prayer partner and how to have that kind of a blessing yeah. in your world. It's amazing. Yeah, beautiful. I know how profound prayer has been even in my life. And it took me a, a bit to segue from organized religion right. into more of a spiritual um, prayer life. I know I know Marianne Williamson's for me was a catalyst for that because I, I know she released a book years ago, a prayer book. Uh, and she she's a great writer and beautifully articulated some of these prayers that that I began to start a prayer life again because that was something I was hesitant to do after coming from mainstream religion. Um, yeah. So I think it's quite profound. Another prayer I, I use every day, um, this may be something you do, but is um, the, um, the prayer that is often used uh, within the 12-step program, um, the serenity prayer. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great one because that kind of encompasses everything in just a very simplistic uh, language, but very, very profound at the same time. Yeah, for sure. There's also, I don't remember it's a third or the seventh step prayer. Um, I'm going to blank on it, but I, when I'm in the shower in the morning, I know exactly yeah, you do. <laughs> because, I, because I do, but I don't have water. <laughs> Coming over me to remember, but it's really something beautiful about um, God. I offer self, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me, um, to build with me. To do it. Anyway, it's a beautiful prayer from the 12 steps. It's all about surrender and removing the blocks so that I can be an example of love. It's a gorgeous prayer. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. After. I have to look at that one. I wanted to ask you about, you know, what I want to sort of keep this in the current context of our time. And, you know, at the moment, I get a sense that there's a great sort of awakening to spirituality or some call it awakening or waking up. Could you speak to that for a moment? What do you think is occurring right now on our planet spiritually for people and personally? Um, yeah. And that's where I actually want to, I want to do, if I may, I want to do a little listening because I don't want to speak to that of my human, of my human self. Yeah. Um, you can look to the intensity of the upset and the anger and the division and then balance that out with how much spiritual power is arising. Guaranteed, there is more light and more spiritual power available than ever before. So use the contrast of the upset not to seduce you into believing that that is what is true. Use it as the springboard. Use it as that which bounces you or pivots you in the direction of your greater commitment to the light because that is what is calling. That darkness is not calling. 
that darkness has no call in it. It has no nothing of, of good or, or well-being in its name. But what it does do to serve you is to become so intense the way an aching foot becomes so painful that you finally go to the doctors to get relief from it. If it were just a pebble in your shoe as a little irritant, you would ignore it and ignore it and ignore it and keep on, keep on, keep on. But if it became something really profound and painful over time, you would have to address it or you wouldn't be able to walk. Think about it that way. That's what's occurring. There is an opportunity for people to turn towards their spirit and know themselves and enjoy themselves and contribute to life in a way that they never, ever, ever, ever could before. We promise you with all that is that if you will look at the darkness, not as real, if you look at the darkness, not as something that is causing pain and suffering, if you will look at it as your catalyst to turn towards the light, you will know yourself what is possible. That is what it serves if people will let it serve them that way. Beautiful. I love that. I know the audience will appreciate you giving a demonstration that they're just using those gifts and, um, it's been so great connecting with you today. And uh, I've really enjoyed this time. I know the audience will, and I hope many people uh, look up your work and watch some of the things that you're doing on YouTube and the course uh, that, you, that you're offering there. Um, it, um, hopefully we can do this again sometime. It's, it's been great connecting you with, with you through, through my session with you and, uh, and, and talking today. I am so grateful that we are brought together. I mean, I talk about opposite sides of the world, <laughs> yeah. you know, that's, that's the beauty here. But, um, again, like, you know, I can't sing your praises enough. I mean, I, you know, before you, you look at my work, do a session with Paul. I mean, I just think you're, you're doing what you're meant to be doing. And I feel, I feel drawn to people who are walking their path of service and doing it well. And, so I, if I may, I bow to you and I, you. I too, I hope we can have more conversations because what a joy. Yeah. Pleasure. Well, thanks again. Yes. Peace and love.